Hello everyone and welcome to another Saturday special. Last week was so much fun to show off Milo to you guys. I was very excited to see that so many of you also have crusty geckos or a few of you were able to show how easy it was to handle Milo and how gentle crusty geckos are, how easy they are to take care of. I will go into more information on all of that in the future because it was so exciting to see how you guys would show that to your, like your parents or someone you're trying to convince that you want a crested gecko and they were like oh they're not so bad and crested geckos are a wonderful introductory reptile they're very easy to set up very easy to maintain that still means you have to do your absolute best for them it doesn't mean like you can just do anything you still have to have the right habitat for them but we'll go into that stuff in future saturday specials and i'll be very excited to and if you guys have any crested gecko tips leave them in the suggestions down below. Baby food is not a crusty gecko tip, just to get that out there. But crusty geckos, as awesome as they are, are not the focus of our Saturday special today. Today, I actually wanted to dig out some of my favorite specimens to show you guys. And that is actually my horseshoe crabs. <laughs> <laughs> I know that may seem so weird to you guys, but how many people have like a horseshoe crab that's bigger than their head in their house? Um, and yes, they're not alive. This is a expired horseshoe crab. This particular specimen, see my specimens for Saturday special, or specimen Saturdays. Uh, but this particular guy I got off the coast of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And uh, actually it was a family friend was walking with us and she saw something in the surf, went down, picked it up, and she was like, what the heck is this? And I was like, oh, horseshoe crab! Oh my gosh! It was the very first uh, horseshoe crab of this size I had ever seen. We had been to the Ripley's Believe It or Not Aquarium actually in Myrtle Beach and I had gotten to kind of pet and play with the, the smaller ones that they had there but I hadn't ever seen a guy that was this big so I was really surprised to see a horseshoe crab specimen of this size um, and especially of all the detail even though he's dead you can see really closely up on his eye caps you can see where his eye caps are still preserved you can see all along the back of his shell where there's scratches and scrapes where he has really been battered around I'm assuming that those are probably post-mortem which means something that happened to him or I should say his remains after he died I have a feeling that the waves and the water just kicked him and tossed him around uh, until you ended up with this big scratch surface here because horseshoe crabs actually molt every year and a little information about these guys if you don't know much about them there are four current species of horseshoe crabs in the world and there's one species only one species that you can find in abundance up along the Atlantic coast down into the Gulf you can find them all the way from Maine down into Mexico and they live just you know in the ocean they eat pretty much absolutely anything. <laughs> they're, they're pretty opportunistic predators. They'll eat clams, crustaceans, worms, uh, but they will eat algae at times or dead animals. It's just kind of whatever they come across. They don't have teeth, even though he looks kind of fearsome and tough. Uh, this guy, and even though he has the name horseshoe crab, Horseshoe crabs are kind of ancient. They showed up on fossil records about 450 million years ago, and they have stuck around ever since, but they're no longer in as much proliferation or size that they used to be. So they're smaller than their ancestors, and they're not actually really crabs. <laughs> they're called horseshoe crabs because they have that nice, tough, durable exoskeleton, but they are more closely related to spiders than anything else. Spiders, scorpions, those kinds of creatures, which I find fascinating. But to get a better idea of what one typically looks like, instead of this guy's nickname is Spartacus, he's kind of beat up uh, and he's missing a lot of his parts. So instead of looking at Spartacus to get an idea of what a horseshoe crab actually looks like, I have a second specimen. This is a much smaller but much, much more intact specimen that I got off of Ocracook Island in North Carolina just this last year in October. And I found this specimen along with dozens and dozens of others up along the beach. And I freaked out because I thought there had been some sort of mass die-off. But actually, horseshoe crabs 
molt every year, especially a small juvenile like this. And they tend to do it around September. So you get all of these guys suddenly washed up on beaches, like I said, all the way from Maine down into Mexico. And you have people freaking out going, they're all dead. Why are they all dead? Is the water toxic? What's happening? And it's actually not a dead horseshoe crab. So this isn't a dead horseshoe crab. This is a molt from a juvenile. So that made me very happy to know that this was this was not actually a result of life ended very shortly for this juvenile horseshoe crab. But because he is a more intact specimen, you can see more entirely what they look like. They have this nice hard shell up in the front and the little back piece right here. And you guys can see the little itty bitty spines that even seem to have what you might consider like fur right here, though it's not. And then they've got this tail, and a lot of people see that tail and they think, oh, stingrays, it, can it hurt me? Is it going to whack me with the tail? And no, actually, they don't have any venom in here. They're not going to, to hurt you with this tail. Uh, it's really actually, this tail is what they use to flip themselves back over. <laughs> so think of this horseshoe crab kind of like a little turtle, and the waves are kicking and swimming, and it knocks him over, and he's like, ah, oh, what do I do? And he'll use this tail to flip himself around, and also to help as he kind of moves around. You're getting sand everywhere, little guy. <laughs> so that's what they do. Um, they use the tail to right themselves, not to like as an aggressive defense or offense sort of tool. They don't really have teeth or mandibles, so they just kind of, uh, they, they actually have gizzards. They grind their food, they kind of get the food in their mouth and they, they grind it as it goes in through their intestinal system like birds do. So they're really kind of harmless <laughs> in a lot of ways. They're, they're pretty innocuous. They, they don't have teeth, they don't smack you with this tail, and they actually provide a very vital function in the medical world. These horseshoe crabs have a type of blood that is very different from human blood. It clots, um, it has a substance called LAL in it, and it actually clots when it comes into contact with a certain bacterial agent. And that's super important. I know that sounds kind of complicated, but the basic story is not only do they have blue blood because they bind with iron, uh, I believe, or copper. Don't quote me on that one. <laughs> I have to double check on that one. But they, they don't have red blood like we do that has oxygen in it. They bind with a whole different mineral and have a different color of blood. And I always thought that was cool, but that blood is used in the medical world and required by the U.S. government to be used in all injectable, like all drugs that would be in your intravenous, intravenous in your veins or injected into you. It is required that horseshoe crab blood, blood from these guys, is tested against whatever drugs they're developing to see if it can contract like any bacterial agents. Every single one of those drugs is required to have their blood tested on it. So they'll actually be horseshoe crab harvest where they go out and they don't kill the horseshoe crabs, hopefully. Some of them do die, so it's a little bit, you want to make sure that that animal welfare is really seen all the way through to sustain these populations, especially with the oceans going through what they are. But they're harvested and they're kind of taken to a little factory where they flip them up and they poke them and they drain about a third of their blood and the horseshoe crab can lose about a third of its blood without too many ill side effects and then they release them again and that's how they harvest horseshoe crab blood to provide a very vital important function for the medical world for humans and it really can't be understated how important these guys are even though they're just related to spiders and they're just puttering around in the oceans of the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. Um, there's several species over in Asia, three species in Asia. I don't know if they have the same sort of thing happen with them. But they're just cute. I, I think they're cute. <laughs> I think they're awesome. I love what they do for us. They're very relaxed little guys. If you guys have ever seen them in an aquarium, they just kind of scuttle around like the little scorpion spider cousins, ancient water cousins that they are but kudos to the horseshoe crab and those are my two specimens so i'm always so excited because when someone comes into your house and they go what the heck is that it's the perfect opportunity to open up 
some conversation about the amazing benefit that they give to the medical world and how cool and ancient these little guys are. So there's my specimens, some of my favorite specimens from around the house. And yes, I'm the kind of person where this is actually, they sit on my front, <laughs> my front bookshelf. So there you go, guys. If you guys have ever seen horseshoe crabs or you know more facts about them or you want to see what color their blood is, mention it down below in the comments and we will learn more about horseshoe crabs. I actually live on the East Coast right now, so it would be amazing to see if one day I could go to one of the facilities and learn a little bit more about how their blood is processed and how their welfare is handled because they provide such an important function you want to take good care of them, you know? They're so cute. <laughs> but thank you guys so much for joining me for another Specimen Saturday. And next week I will come up with another one of my amazing specimens and amazing pets to be able to show you guys. So have a wonderful Saturday. And remember you guys, stay curious. Bye-bye. <laughs>